Kids W5. It was so terrible sound. A country at war. Really just average everyday people that are now defending their home. Uh, but we're not sure how long that can last. Uh, oh God. Patriots desperately defend the homeland. Every single Ukrainian will be doing what we're all doing. People ask me what to do, I tell them we have to go fight. Slow, Green. Slow, Green. 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 Slow. Here is Avery Haynes. Welcome to W5 and a one-hour special on the Russian invasion of Ukraine. As the world holds its breath for what might happen next, a humanitarian crisis is unfolding, and regular Canadians are preparing to join the battlefield. First, we take you straight to the front line with Canadian journalist Finn Depensier in the heart of Ukraine's second largest city, Kharkiv. I arrived in Kharkiv two hours after the invasion began, having taken the overnight train from Kiev. It wasn't long before the shelling began. Throughout this city, Ukraine's second largest, scenes of buildings being hit. A million and a half people live here. Now, a civilian population is under assault. When I got off the train, it was rush hour in the other direction. The, the train station was an absolute zoo. There were hundreds, if not thousands, of people trying to catch the next train west immediately. And we made our way to the Kharkiv Palace Hotel, where about 20 to 30 other journalists were staying. When we arrived at the hotel, the scene was just like dozens of journalists in the lobby, filling their stories, frantically talking with their teams, trying to figure it out. And then we went upstairs to get breakfast and there was some soft like lounge jazz music playing and it was truly bizarre and unnerving. The Russians had actually encircled the city so we were very cautious at this point and we didn't really leave the hotel for the next 24 hours. Okay, so it is 6.30 in the morning and we were just awoken over the intercom by the hotel management who are now telling us get to the basement, which is our bomb shelter. So we're on, there, we're on our way there right now. About half of the people in the hotel were probably down there, but not everyone went down immediately or at all. It was exhausting to constantly descend into the bomb shelter and then come back up. Sometimes we just sat in the lobby with our bulletproof vests on so we could do our work with the Wi-Fi. Those who weren't lucky enough to have a hotel basement miles away from the front line were uploading videos from their windows. Thousands, however, were able to take shelter in the tunnels of Kharkiv's Soviet-era subway system, which was designed to withstand a nuclear attack. So on the second day, Russia targeted a natural gas pipeline on the outskirts of the city. There was a massive explosion, but we couldn't really differentiate that from all the other explosions we were hearing. To us, it was just one of many. And it, it was hard to distinguish between what was, I guess, routine shelling and what was the targeting of some critical infrastructure in the city. It was quite surreal to be hearing what was going on and then getting the visuals on our phones a few minutes later. Apparently, Putin and the Kremlin thought that this would be an easy war, and within one to three days, they would have already rolled into Kiev. But that's not what happened at all. The Ukrainian military, as well as armed Ukrainian civilians, have mounted a remarkably stiff defense. The Ukrainians are being led by a comic who is now president and is refusing to leave. He defiantly taped this post in the streets of Kiev to counter propaganda that he'd fled the country. Ukrainians are still fighting and they're refusing to give up. Embarrassing a nuclear superpower and the fifth largest army in the world.
When there was a break in the shelling, and we found a driver who was willing to take us to the front line. We risked a trip to the outskirts of Kharkiv around midday. And in the car on our way there, the conversation wasn't about what was on the news or what was unfolding around the country. It was about a contingency plan should one of us get hurt. That's my colleague, Jack Crosby, reporting for Rolling Stone magazine. If, if anyone is injured, where will you take us? I think to the closest uh, hospital. We wanted to see what was going on at the train station, having arrived there only a few days ago. So behind me is the line to get on the next train, whenever it comes. Um, I don't know if everybody's going to be able to get on here, but uh, the last person I talked to that got out of the train station said that it's a bit of a free-for-all and everybody just kind of crams on. And, I, and, this, and this could be us a little later. We're not sure yet if we're going to take the train, car, or a bus. We're going to figure it out. We spoke to one guy who was 18 years old, heading west with his 17-year-old classmates. His classmates will be trying to leave the country through Moldova, or Romania, or Poland, but as a man who's 18 years old, he's not allowed to leave the country anymore, and so he'll be stopping somewhere along his journey west to get out and fight for Ukraine. Sounds like a new Russian offensive has began right now, actually, because this is a pretty consistent barrage of artillery. Um, I'm seeing some equipment now being moved down the street. So this is the, if I look up this way, that's towards uh, the northern part of the city. So up that way is Russia. And that's where Russian forces are, um, are dug in. But there's been battles going on throughout the entire um, a circumference of the city. So on that day, the Ukrainians actually did something very ingenious, which is that they withdrew from their front lines, they pulled back into the city a little bit, then they allowed the Russians to walk in. And then once the Russians were inside the city, the Ukrainian military clobbered them from both sides. And the Russians were pushed out within a few hours. So around this time, we started to see videos circulating of Russian prisoners of war. They were being paraded in front of the cameras by the Ukrainians. We were told we were going on military exercises, he says. This POW says he's a reservist, called up, and he answers, I want to go home. What needs to be done for that to happen? Ask the commander of Chief Putin to take me away from here. Taken prisoner, but they're the lucky ones. On the outskirts of town, more examples of wrecked Russian armor. Back on the road, we find evidence of the carnage. We found a number of destroyed Russian vehicles, including an APC and some other armor, and there were still some Russian bodies on the ground. The Ukrainians let us film, but demanded that we didn't show any of their faces nor reveal their positions. Lying in the snow, a sign of the abject failure of Russia's invasion, a dead soldier abandoned by his comrades. And suddenly, we were ordered to get to the trenches. The Ukrainians had just shelled Russian positions, and they were expecting a volley in return. Can you ask them why we're doing this? Come on. Something may come. No. Thankfully, not. In the morning light, Kharkiv under attack again. One of our colleagues who woke us at about 8 in the morning, said that we had a car ready to take us to Dnipro, and we had to get all our things ready in five minutes. It was time to go. The same driver that drove us to the front lines, Vlad, agreed that he'd take us to the city of Dnipro, about a three-hour drive from Kharkiv. Uh, the Ukrainians are still putting up a very stiff resistance up in Kharkiv, uh, but we're not sure how long that can last. Um, so we'll see what happens. Um, oh, God. So we just got to pull to the side of the road here. 
just a military ambulance driving through here. Um, there were a lot of checkpoints, obviously, in between Kharkiv and here, and can't film at those because we can't be giving away uh, Ukrainian army positions. Behind us in Kharkiv, Ukrainians line up to buy bread as the rumbles come closer, and then a full-on bombardment of civilian neighborhoods. By this point in the invasion, the Russians were growing increasingly frustrated. Having not been able to take the city of Kharkiv with their infantry, they were now resorting to more indiscriminate and aggressive attacks on civilian areas using missiles and artillery. And then this blast, hitting Freedom Square just 350 meters where we had been staying. When we saw that video of Freedom Square being hit, we knew that we had made the right decision, and we feared for our colleagues that had decided to stay back in Kharkiv, and we hoped they'd make it to Dnipro soon. We were still at this point staying a few days ahead of the war. Dnipro may have looked relatively normal, but this was a city preparing for attack. A city in the center of Ukraine on the Dnepr River, Dnipro provided refuge to those fleeing pro-Russian separatists in the Donbass after war broke out in 2014, with a museum providing remembrance for the lives lost. And while these Soviet-era tanks and guns are just for show, fighting is on everybody's mind. Like this father and son, who are both prepared to enlist. Uh, at this center, volunteers gather to make up supplies for the front lines. Upstairs, it's medicine, as if every drugstore in the city has been emptied into the room. And downstairs, they're preparing sandbags. Back upstairs in the office area, they're coordinating the delivery of supplies to the front lines. Later that afternoon at a secret location, Citizen volunteers have made thousands of Molotov cocktails. They show us their secret recipe and then demonstrate how to use them. No. Ukrainian citizens have been given instructions online how to use them against Russian military vehicles. Many Ukrainians believe that the only way to repel their invaders is by arming average citizens. So I think about the people that I met at the Volunteer Center and at the Molotov Cocktail Factory. They're really just average, everyday people that are now defending their home. Uh, they can't leave like us. They, they don't have a safe country to go to like Canada. Um, and they're going to see this fight all the way through. At least that's what they told us, and I have every reason to believe them. I never imagined that the Russians would invade all of Ukraine. Our strategy so far has been to stay a few days ahead of their invasion. We're just trying to remain calm. We're going to make the right choice and get out of the country as soon as possible. And so we found a bus that would take us west to Poland. That journey, a thousand kilometers across a country at war. Back in Kharkiv, the Russian destruction of the city continues.